Good morning and happy birthday, Richard. Wonderful that you decided to come and join us. Um, right, so my job is to tell you a bit again about what the dialogue people have been doing for the past year and what we're planning to do. And uh, it was sort of a little bit difficult when I put this together because I you know, looked at the roadmap and I was thinking, well, nothing's really changing very much in terms of roadmap. And we, we, uh, we're now doing, you know, we did Dyna in North America, we did a tour of European APL user meetings, and many of you have actually seen this slide now probably two or three times. So as Gita said, in terms of direction, we're starting to feel quite comfortable about where we're going. There are no major changes of direction to tell you about. But there is a stunning quantity of little pieces of work being done by all those 20 people to move us along in this direction. He just said we come to this meeting really for your benefit, but for me even, it's actually good to come here and learn about what people at Dialog are doing. Uh, we, there's so much going on that in fact we've had to switch a lot of presentations to a 30 minute format. So you'll see they're really short presentations. We're thinking if you can't get your main idea across in 20 minutes, you won't do it in 40 either. Um, so hopefully that's going to work and we're going to all stop early enough uh, to give you time for questions. Gita has wisely given me 10 minutes more than I, th I thought I had. I'll probably overrun. Anyway, so the important things, performance, that's uh, always been important and is always going to be important. And of course, these days, including parallel computing and just keeping up with the changes in hardware that are happening all the time because... Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Portability, I know most of you are still either using Windows or uh, AIX and some people starting to use Linux, but we think the new operating systems, Android, uh, Windows, Universal, and so on, are going to be important. Maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but we're doing work to make sure that in five years when you decide you really do need to move your APL systems to those platforms, everything will be ready. And of course, there's still, after 50, although 50 years have passed, there are really quite a lot of interesting things that are worth adding to, to the language. Uh, Gita mentioned Adam, who's joined us this year, and that's uh, also reflecting this. We are re that's really a side where we are increasing focus without trying to take focus away from anything else. We need to spend more time on building tools, both for you. I know a lot of you already have tools that you built 10 years ago or 20 years ago that are really... So you're maybe unlikely to use these new tools, but in terms of attracting a new generation of users, they will expect a language system to come with quite a wide variety of tools that really uh, still uh, need work. Okay, so here's a slide simply from last year that I'm reusing. Parallel processing is getting critical. If we don't have a good story on that in five years' time, uh, it's going to be difficult to claim that APL is relevant. Talked about the platforms. And then sort of a rather specific technical detail related really to the new platforms. We now think we're, we're quite sure where we should be investing the bulk of our energy in terms of providing you with new tools to build user interfaces for the new platforms and for your existing platforms. So another slide from last year to talk about not just parallel processing but performance in general. We have these tools called Futures and Isolates which were introduced a year ago and have been enhanced a little bit. We're still really waiting for people to start using them in anger and give us the feedback that we need to feel comfortable with the design and really turn them into primitives. At the moment, they're sort of partly modeled in APL. Please use them a bit and give us some feedback so we can really finish that work. Uh, we have what we called the dialogue compiler last year. We're sort of thinking now we should really call it an optimized bytecode execution engine rather than a compiler. You know, you can argue about how many angels there are on the head of a pin, but also to differentiate it from Aaron Zhu's work where he's building a real, what people would traditionally think of as a compiler. Uh, but this is a tool that Jay is going to be talking about later, um, which really reduces the overhead. It's going to make your APL applications run faster. Both of these things are things where we're trying to provide you with functionality where 
you won't have to make much change to your applications to take advantage of them. Minimal little tweaks, little refactorings, uh, without major changes, you can get much better performance. And then, separately from that, we're working with Aaron Zhu at Indiana University. So Aaron's been working now, what is it, two, three years? Um, I think this year it's, uh, it's starting to look really quite interesting. Um, but we're really breaking new ground here. And, you know, whether this will actually give you a tool that's going to be valuable to you, uh, we don't know. Certainly to use it, you're going to have to rewrite your code in a more functional style to take advantage of this. Uh, but if, if Aaron is successful and you can do a little bit of refactoring, we're going to be able to target massively parallel architectures uh, with very fine-grained data parallelism um, using that technology. In addition to these sort of new compiler th initiatives and so on, we're also working just on rewriting a lot of the core algorithms. The interpreter is, I mean, APL is 50 years old. Dialog is only 30, 32, 3 years old. And the physical architectures just of a single core machine has changed quite radically in the last five to ten years. We've talked about that before, the ratio between the memory speeds and the CPU cache speeds. So there's a lot of rewriting to do. This is a graph uh, from our performance QA system where we time 14,000 different APL expressions. Well, actually, there's not that many expressions, but with different combinations of arguments. And then every time we, about once a week, we pull one of these charts out and we rank the expression groups into 140 groups and we just sort them by how well they're doing to get this performance profile. So blue is good. That means all these expression groups here have really speeded up. Um, generally that's work done either by Roger or Jay. And then as you work, you know, there's always a little, as you rewrite an algorithm, there's always going to be cases that, uh, but this, this one is really good. There's a very small red tail. Last year, for version 14, it looked like this. We actually had significantly more upside, but more of a tail. People who installed this version upgraded, I think, reported typically, I mean, a 25% increase on running their applications. So these groups were well chosen. Um, and if you add the two up, if you add up, um, accumulate 14.0 and 14.1, you see we've been able to deal with a lot of the tail that was there. So a lot of the work that went into 14.1 has removed part of the red tail, and this is just the tsunami is, uh, is building up. So you should expect something like this. It gets harder, of course, every year, now that we're focusing on it. Uh, but we will, you can rest assured that we will continue to invest heavily in that kind of work, no matter what else we're, we're doing. So in 14.1, which was released in June, uh, there are a number of idioms that you, if you come to Roger's talk uh, on speeding things up, he'll tell you more about these things. It's worth following that list with every release. We publish a, re a list of uh, code that's been speeded up. You probably use these in your application uh, various places. Um, and J in, in 14.1 really very significantly enhanced the applicability of his bytecode execution engine. So in 14.0, when we introduced this uh, experimental feature, it could handle, we have an application that a customer has given us, a very large application. He could compile 1% of their functions. In 14.1, it's 59, and he'll tell you, uh, later this week, what the what he thinks the number might be for for version 15. What this bytecode execution engine essentially does is that if you have arguments, if you're running primitives with small arguments, it will speed your code up by roughly a factor of two on small arguments. And of course, if you if you do any timing, if you do measurements of what a typical existing APL application does with our primitives, nearly all the arguments are small. It's very rare that you actually have these very large arguments to a primitive. So this is something that gives noticeable impact on, on applications. And that's in addition to the blue, the blue wave. 
So for version 15.0, which will be coming out early next year, we're carrying on with the various compiler bytecode execution projects. Um, we are uh, doing a large part, a large piece of work this year to simply upgrade the C compilers that we use on all platforms, which is something I think we haven't done for nearly a decade due to sort of runtime compatibility issues. We don't want to. It's, it's a problem for you every time we do this because there's a new runtime that you need to distribute and so on. And of course, every when we do this, we get speed ups by switching to the new compiler. We also get a whole bunch of slowdowns, and we need to spend time pulling that red tail up, but now at least we can measure it uh, and we can do that. Yeah, and of course, more work on core algorithms, some integration of futures and isolates into the interpreter. How many people have actually tried the futures and isolates? I'm interested. That's not, not enough. Um, so we think we're sort of in a bit of a catch-22 situation here. You don't want to use them before we make them primitives. And we don't want to make them primitives until you use them. APL programmers seem to be extraordinarily conservative about learning new technologies. They, sort of, they basically won't look at it until it's either a quad function or a primitive. Can you please try and get your programmers to spend a little bit of time this coming six months and give us feedback on futures and isolates and, and the other work that's going on that we can use to direct uh, development. Uh, the, the, you know, Jay's work on the compiler is also we labeling a number of things as experimental at the moment to sort of give us a little bit of wiggle room in terms of being able to redefine it. But please don't let that discourage you from at least testing it. Your feedback to us in that process is really, really important. So talks about this later this week. Jay is talking about his bytecode execution engine on Wednesday. And in fact, Wednesday morning is a bit of a performance uh, section. Uh, Bob Vernecki is going to be talking about work that he's doing uh, in addition to these two talks. On the core performance, Roger and Jay have a talk uh, later today on what they're doing. And Roger has a workshop on Thursday. So if you're really interested in improving the performance of your application, go to Roger's workshop on Thursday afternoon, and he'll be talking about how he thinks about writing efficient code. Um, that would be a good time to give some feedback as well. So here's another slide from last year, the new platforms ones. The only difference in this slide, I've colored part of it green. It seems Microsoft have now decided what they want to call the thing that was Metro and then Windows Modern. It's now Universal Windows Platform. Um, the good news for a lot of us is if you follow uh, what's happening or in what Microsoft is doing, they are pulling back a bit from this managed code thing where they say everything has to be managed code. And in fact, uh, part of this new Windows 10 platform initiative where they're trying to get everybody onto a single platform, right? they're giving away upgrades free, I believe, Windows 10. Um, is that you can also now put desktop applications into the Windows Store. And to me, that's a very strong signal that the old technologies, Win32 and so on, that we are using now, are not in any danger of disappearing. But of course, in terms of being able to install things in large organizations or build apps that people can download on their cell phones and so on, the old technologies are a problem. So if you're building corporate apps, uh, you can probably get away with Win32 for, you know, until we all retire. But if you want to target the desktop, uh, sorry, the mobile phones and the tablets and have downloadable apps, you need to look at the Universal or Android or, or iOS when we get there. Um, but everything we think about now at Dialog, when we're thinking about new tools and so on, the first question is really, can we make this cross-platform? So. We're doing work to make it more similar to be working on Windows and Linux and Unix. And we're making sure that when we add Android and UWP and so on, all these tools, the ride, the my server, web services, the R interface, the cryptographic library, and of course the old tools that have been around for decades were already 
cross-platform. SQAPL, in fact, with its roots at Insight Systems, was a tool that was used not just for Dialog APL, but APL Plus and Sharp APL uh, as well. But we really focusing very hard on this goal of allowing you to develop on any platform and deploy on any platform where we have an APL system available. So, and yes, version 14.1 for OS X. I was going to do this whole presentation on my Mac. I'll just switch it on so you can see the, the color, the light on the Apple. Uh, my baggage was lost until yesterday evening and I didn't have time to rehearse and make sure it all worked on the Mac, but uh, um, I'm not sure what, Nick, what are you planning? You're going to be using Linux, right? Ah, of course. So, but uh, if you're interested in the Mac, come and see me and I'll show it to you. So the important thing, um, and this will be the same, I think, for nearly all the platforms that we move to, is that it, it's always going to be a complete dialogue engine. For a lot of the new platforms, uh, like the Mac, we may decide that we are only going to distribute 64-bit Unicode. We are not going to bother to build classic or 32-bit versions of these. Of course, if you're a major customer and you have to use 32-bit Unicode on it, you can come and talk to us. But our focus, for us, the primary environment for all the work that we do, all the thinking that we do first, is 64-bit Unicode. And I think we have more than half the customer base now moved on to those platforms, uh, no, no matter how you divide it up. It includes all the important tools. It doesn't have uh, ODBC interface yet, but where's Bjorn? Should, should be what you're that's what you're working on now, right, during the conference. <laughs> Just kidding. It's coming very soon. If you have... One of the problems there is deciding which ODBC interface to go for. So if any Mac users here, uh, I mean, Windows is so beautifully easy because Microsoft did the ODBC. On, on the other platforms, they're competing ODBC driver manager standards, and we need to pick one. So if you're thinking of writing a database application on the Mac, please talk to Bjorn about which drivers you think are, are the important ones to support. Um, and we are not going to try and put Quad WC GUI on these things. We are not going to try and emulate 30, Win32 on all these platforms. It's just not worth it. We would be doing you a big disfavor by giving you a 1985 style user interface on these new platforms. So we're focusing on, at the moment, our idea is my server, and um, we'll talk about that a bit later. So far, since the release, uh, about 70 people have downloaded the Mac version. Nick's going to be showing you the user interface for this. It's the first platform that uses the ride as its primary uh, ID. And here's a, here's a picture of it that was taken earlier this year. So the idea, you know, it looks, it's got a language bar, and in many ways it's just like working in the Windows environment. It doesn't have the Workspace Explorer yet and, and other tools like that. And here are some pictures of some MyServer UIs that were built to take that screenshot. So we, we're we saying, in, specifically in terms of user interfaces, we're even more sure this year than we were last year that people building cross-platform applications will use HTML5 JavaScript. We said at least five years last year, and you know that, that's we still believe that to be true. We said last year, new Microsoft desktop applications will use Windows Presentation Foundation. I think this year we're maybe saying some new Microsoft desktop applications and these UWP apps will use either WPF or UWP, which is also a XAML-based, uh, it has a XAML-based way of describing user interface, which is almost identical to it. WPF, but of course not exactly, so the widgets are slightly different. But I think we're hoping that we'll be able to plug into those, and any skills that you learn today by going to a WPF workshop or playing with WPF will be transferable to this uh, environment. You'll hear us talking more and more about data binding uh, and this model view, view model style of application building. So basically that means the data in your variables in the workspace map directly to the user interface. Uh, we already support that fairly well for WPF and 
the next year's work on my server is going to focus on enabling this data binding also in that environment. So if you're not familiar with this term, I think it's a pretty old term in, in computer user interface theory. But the idea is you have your data and you basically you want it to appear in a list, for example. And then at the top here you have a filter and that's just a variable maybe called filter. When you assign to that, you want that field to update and you want some code to run and the filtered data to appear over here. And then you also want a variable maybe to be created as a result of that so your program can just refer to this filtered list. And one of the really important things about writing your code in that way is that you could replace the user interface with another technology or in fact you could run the application completely without a user interface. You should be able to run assign to list, assign to filter and have filtered list as a result of how you've described the way your model works. So it's really about separating and this what this will do for you if you adopt this is that when the next technology change appears, your code is just going to work on a new platform. It becomes almost trivial to move code from one platform to another. So this my server thing that we're working on that you'll hear more about in this conference, most people would initially think of that, well, it's something that you would run on a server and then you'll go through the internet or maybe your local area network and you'll run a web browser. But what we're thinking is actually we're going to hook it up we're going to embed, we're going to provide for you an embedded HTML JavaScript rendering engine. Whether it'll be hooked up directly to the interpreter or the ride or be a standalone component is something we're still working on. But what that means is the same user interface definition will work in a web browser. You can write a web application, host it on the web. Or you can run it on the desktop by directing this component back at APL and having it act as a server without the internet connection. And that's something we see other people adopting as a way of working and we think it really, we think at the moment this is the future. So either take a look of it or if you don't agree with that, please let us know what you think uh, you'd rather have us look at. Of course, in addition to user interface work, I know many of you build very large applications where you have other teams perhaps working in, in uh, C Sharp or Java or other technologies building the user interface. Part of this work is also enabling that you can easily call APL as a service. So you don't have to use this technology, but we know that many people who are prototyping new applications, for example, they have to be able to prototype that first user interface themselves to get the project off the ground and we must provide a tool like this. So we're not saying that you know all the big legacy products will be converted to use my server but we think it's a technology that's going to be really important for bringing new users in. So in the version 15 time frame there's more work to do on data binding as people start using it we find their performance uh, issues, their edge cases. So John Daintree has been doing more work on that He's going to talk about it tomorrow. Data binding the matrix. See if you can guess what he's able to do now. And then the My Server 3 work uh, this year. I'm going to be talking about more about, I'm going to tell you more about HTML uh, for half an hour this afternoon. And then first thing tomorrow morning, Dan and Adam are going to show you a bit about the control, the set of widgets and controls that are now provided with My Server. So, the direction is, is much the same, unchanged from last year, but we feel we've moved quite significantly forward. You know, we have a new platform. We don't do anywhere near enough at Dialog to celebrate our successes. It's actually quite, quite cool. Um, but we are Europeans, after all. Um, on the language side, which is sort of not one of those main... Um, focus areas as such. There's still a lot of a lot of ideas both from other array languages and J, Sharp, APL, K and so on that we think are worth cherry picking and moving into APL. We've done a fair amount of that in the last few years with rank and key. Um, but one sort of fundamental direction is we want to move in what you might call a functional direction. So APL has been recognized as what they call a functional 
programming language right from before functional programming was really um, invented. APL had an influence on what later became functional programming. Um, in a nutshell, what functional programming means is you try and write all your code so it takes an argument and re returns a result and it doesn't mess with anything, you know, it doesn't use semi-global variables. Um, the more you can rewrite sections of your code to be functional, um, the more you're going to be able to parallelize it. So both compi you know, compilers and things like futures and isolates, any attempt to parallelize code is going to work much better if you can write as much of your code in a functional style as possible. So defuns, which started as an experiment that, that John's, well, how long ago is that? 20 years ago. About 20 years ago, which you know many people have seen as a bit of a curiosity. That we're really saying to you now strongly, you should look at that, and we're going to invest a lot in making that really first-class part of Dialog APL. We're going to make it more debuggable and traceable. There's still some weak areas with respect to defense, and our compiler work and so on is going to focus on that. And we also think, I mean, our experience, I think both John Scholes and my experience in going out to other communities is that the, the landscape has really changed in the last 10 years. If you come now and present APL as a functional array programming language to young kids, they think it's very cool. Um, so it's also part of making a, putting APL back uh, on the map. Um, and then, sort of slightly related to that, but maybe a, a different focus, we really want to add features that will help uh, with analysis of big data. So things like key, and, and other language features. So in version 14, uh, we did a bunch of stuff, rank, key, tally, uh, function train, dyadic iota on higher rank arrays, uh, the futures and isolates. In version 14.1, there were really not a lot of uh, language features. We took a bit of a break working on performance and so on. There were some .NET tools to help .NET programmers dispose of their garbage. There's a JSON parser and external workspace files, which will also be a talk about uh, on Wednesday. We're sort of gearing up for version 15, or probably actually the, the next version after that to put in the next wave of, of language features. There's still a few things left to do. So these are ideas from uh, other array languages, cut, tessellate, merge, and dual, that uh, we'll be talking about on Thursday, I think. Um, Phil Last is going to be joining us remotely. Hopefully, it, the internet will be good enough for that to work, to talk about ideas he has for a notation for array constants so that we can e more easily use text, Unicode text, as the source for your entire application. We sort of have it working for code, but there's still a hole there for what to do with data. Um, so that's something I think has, has become important as a result of the focus on trying to use industry standard tools for, for source code management. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, we're not going to run out of things to do for the next decade or two. Um, there's lots of good ideas, lots of things that would, you know, some things that are just cute, other things that would really be useful to you. I don't know uh, how to prioritize these at the moment. Tell us what you think is important. The active language research work that we're doing that's going to go into either 15.0 or 15.1, uh, into 15.0, so within the next six, uh, six to 12 months, we're looking at, uh, some of you may know that if you need to do searching on, on large data, there's a trick at the moment where you can compose a left argument to dyadic iota or a right argument to epsilon and a couple of other cases like that. But there's no way to update the keys. So when you have another record, another key in your database, you have to redo this assignment and we have to rehash the entire collection. And if that's hundreds of millions of records, that might freeze your server in its tracks for a second or two, which is something you really don't want. So we're looking at an idea at the moment for simply marking this key array as searchable. And then the system will take care of keeping uh, the hashes up to date. And you won't need to use tricks like this. If you use 
a searchable array as an argument to iota or epsilon, the interpreter will know that it has this hash table and just use it. And some forms of modification of the array will automatically maintain the table. We have people who have very large, what you might call in-memory databases, so large arrays that they keep around that are re referenced all the time by their application but don't get updated very frequently. Uh, and we're looking at ideas to keep those outside the main workspace in order to improve the efficiency of the memory manager and to um, reduce the problem of having to pick a workspace size that's going to accommodate uh, all these things. So the plan is to publish proposal for these new features on via our social media channels. So, you know, how many people follow us on Facebook or Twitter? Okay, that's not bad. Could be better, though. Uh, if, your comp if your corporate policy doesn't allow you to do that, uh, well, we will send, we, we do send announcements out through other channels as well. So Roger and John are going to talk about the proposals for these new operators, probably not targeting uh, 15, but the, the release after that. So we've already talked a fair amount about these tools for, for application building that we're now really focusing on, on making cross-platform. Um, some of them have been around for a very long time. This one is not cross-platform, but I think everything else... Oh, and this one also is, is uh, Windows-specific. But all the others are things that we are really trying to make cross-platform. The new frontiers that we see on the tool side, there's a crypto cryptography is also getting very, very important. You, if you don't understand about cryptography sometime within the next five years and you're working with large corporations, you will fail an internal audit or an external audit, which might be worse. Um, we have a cryptographic library which is cross-platform, which is available. It's a workspace. We haven't really done much with it. Bjorn did a talk last year trying to motivate you all to learn about cryptography. It's available now. This is a field, like many of the fields that we're working in now, where the ground is really shifting fast under our feet. And the operating systems have added a lot of features for doing cryptography for you. And so there's a bit of a, a dilemma here between having something cross-platform which doesn't cooperate with the operating systems or trying to leave as much as possible to the operating systems and still give you something which appears like a cross-platform tool. So Bjorn is working on that design uh, at the moment. If you're thinking about using cryptography anytime soon, please talk to Bjorn while you're here and tell us what you're planning to do. That would be very valuable to us in prioritizing what to, what to emphasize. Data-bound MyServer we talked about. I'll talk more about that this afternoon. Maybe the, the most radical new thing, something that we haven't really discussed at all, is this, uh, I have a talk about this uh, later tomorrow. We think, in, particularly in order to attract the new users, we have to provide a mechanism where you can say, well, I'd like a new dialogue web server application in their, you know, the development environment of their choice. And it builds a little folder with 12 files in it, and you double-click on something, and it's running. And then we integrate with Git or Mercurial SVN and so on and provide tools so that they can press a button and build a runtime environment for Linux or a .NET assembly or whatever. I'll be talking more about that tomorrow. But that's something, sort of really a big, a new piece of work that we're opening up right now. And of course, utility libraries and sample applications to go with that is something that Adam and the tools group are going to be focusing on. And we have, okay, this is not really a new frontier. This is closing off an old frontier, but I needed a, a slide to put it on. Sharp Rain Pro, the graphics package that Adrian Smith built uh, probably also 20 years ago, was translated into C Sharp and became a .NET assembly some years ago. And there was a little piece missing, the new leaf, which is a publication management thing where you can take these charts and put them in and flow them with text has been missing. Nick has now completed the work so that we have this fully as a .NET assembly, but
but also as APL code that you could run on the new platform. So he's going to be talking about that on Thursday. I'm going to be talking about the project um, on Wednesday and related slightly to the dialogue project. The user commands are in some ways the precursor to the project, uh, the project project. And Dan and Adam are going to be giving you an update on that uh, later this afternoon. One thing which is related to this, there have been in the past some difficulties in writing code that just dealt with files. If you needed to list files, create directories, delete files without opening them and so on, you've had to write your own uh, functions to call operating system, bits of the operating system platform or shell out in Unix to do it. And we've decided now is the time to provide in the interpreter a set of tools to do any of those things. The ride project, so the remote IDE, which is the cross-platform graphical IDE that we think will gradually displace the, even on Windows, the, the Windows UI, the plan there for the next year is to publish the API so that third-party people can start writing front ends to dialog APL and also to give you a zero footprint version of that so that you could run an IDE for Dialog APL from a web browser without installing anything on the client. And then there's a thing called the Ride Process Manager which you could use to connect to a server and launch processes and monitor them and so on. It's also part of that. And we don't know exactly which order these are going to come in. If you're planning or you think your plans might include uh, Android, Windows or iOS in the next. We've actually had a couple of people talk to us about iOS already. Please tell us so we can decide which order to do them in because otherwise we're just going to do them in the order that some developer decides is is fun because we have no other real way to, to prioritize the work. So Richard's going to be talking about, he's going to celebrate by talking about cross-platform file functions later today. Uh, and then finally, the, the shouting from the, the rooftops. This is something where we've actually become a lot more active uh, in the last year. We've been slowly building up to this. But last year, just after the conference, I went to functional conf, a functional programming conference in Bangalore and talked about APL to a room full of about 200 Indian functional programmers. Uh, and as a result of that, I ended up about six months later doing this talk on Google. I don't know how many of you have seen this, but I was invited to Google the Googleplex in Mountain View and did a presentation to about 40 Google people. And then they recorded it and put it on. I think we're getting towards 1,500 people who have viewed it, which of course isn't really Google-sized numbers. But I think it's more people than I have ever talked to about APL in my life so far. So that's not bad. And there's still five, between five and ten people watching it every day. Um, and I'm actually leaving you here on Wednesday to go to Bangalore because this year this conference overlaps with ours. And I decided I'd rather spend the last day going over and preaching, you know, rather than preaching to the choir, go and preach to some new people. Because it was so much fun last year. I'll show you some quotes in a minute from what they said about it. So this is how, when, when we are in these external forums, this is how we describe APL, because this is using the kind of language that they, they appreciate. So dialogue is, you need to learn this, and maybe next year we'll try and say it uh, together. So dialogue is a modern, array-first, multi-paradigm programming language. And then it's all the paradigm, you know. And so we mention APL, you know, it's built on APL. We're not in any way unhappy. We're proud to be APLers, but we are fo in terms of the message, we're focusing on other aspects of it. So this is the, the, the sign that was outside FUCONF last year when I got there. You see there's dialogue, and then there's F-sharp and Erlang and all these other minor languages. We were gold gold sponsor for the event. And... Uh, these guys were tweeting as I was as I was doing my talk. I don't know whether this is going to be big enough. Oh no, go away. They were saying things like, "With APL, I feel like a Sith Lord. So much power, 
So, in fact, this year, it's not just me, but Jay is also coming with me to Bangalore because we were asked to come back and teach a full-day course in APL, which we'll be doing next uh, Sunday. And this guy is coming, and he's bringing two of his Padawan apprentices uh, to that workshop. They said things like, uh, APL has a selfie operator and can do brainstorming operations. Morton is performing parallel brain surgery on his audience. I'm not sure they actually understood everything that I was doing <laughs> because one of them tweeted, I think Morton just implemented LinkedIn in 20 lines of code. That must have been a good demo. Thanks, Roger, for helping me put that, uh, that together. Um, yeah. And then they had this board up where people could come as they walked, you know, during the conference, they could go up and scribble on this board anything that they had been impressed by. And the board was just covered in APL. Uh, and I did a workshop after it where the uh, Bruce Tate, the author of seven programming languages in seven weeks, he asked the people in his workshop, he said, well, what do you think was the most uh, impressive thing at functional conf? And about half the people said APL to him. I think he sort of shrugged it off and uh, you know, that didn't happen. But, uh, but we are actually becoming a little bit respectable and we're going to keep working on that. Yeah. So, zero, says Roger, and there won't be time for questions. Uh, Gita was right to give me 10 extra minutes. I used every second. So here's what we're doing. Uh, I won't read them out to you, it's more of the same. But the good thing is that we actually think we have new users on new platforms in sight. You know, We can see them out there. Uh, but of course, we're going to put on our own oxygen mask before helping others. So the primary thing is to help you guys be successful. Yeah, but getting new recruits for you is an important part, I think, of, of helping you be successful. So, so thank you for listening. <laughs>